Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Ritman Grace Podcast. We hope that it will encourage you as you seek to follow God and grow in your faith. If you would like to know more about our church, you can check us out at www.ritmangrace.org or feel free to email us at ritmangbc at aol.com. But for right now, let's get into today's message. Thank you very much, David. Appreciate that. Um, he is correct that if um, anyone is interested in things such as baptism, we would love to talk to you about that. To help with the vote, we're willing to baptize people in other states or even those who are not living. We're willing to anything to beef up the voting, right? Okay, that was not nice. Sorry about that. Maybe this will be more appropriate. We're um, Today we're talking about the spiritual discipline of silence and solitude. You've heard of a um, moment of silence. So why don't we just have a, an hour of silence right now? And... Okay, maybe we better conclude that. So, Yes, we've been uh, looking at the different spiritual disciplines in a Christian life. So, so far we looked at... Um, Bible intake study and the Word of God, very, very critical and also very foundational. Um, Prayer is one that uh, we really need to be a part of. We need to be intimate with God in in our prayer life if we want to grow and and have some spiritual success at all. Worship is important. When we talked about that, we kind of took the view of corporate worship, all of us together at that time. That's what we looked at in week three. Then in evangelism, uh, sharing our faith, that should be natural, should be um, important to us. We all love and care for people, some of whom don't know Christ. So that should just be something that's on our heart and mind all the time. Serving one another, serving the Lord, serving one another, very important. And then um, we looked at stewardship as well, just the, that every aspect of life, everything in our life, is to be given to the Lord. And we are caretakers, managers of everything that God has in this world and and has for us. And last week we looked at fasting, uh, that discipline really of just focusing on Christ and and, uh, committing our thoughts and our patterns to him. So today we're gonna talk about silence and solitude. And to be honest with you, which I hope we always are, Um, all the other seven disciplines could really stand a little silence and solitude in our lives. All of them interplay with each other. Very, very important stuff. Uh, I noticed that uh, Pastor Clark has been sharing a verse from 1 Timothy 4, 7, and that's the um, New uh, New American Standard Version there um, that reminds us that we are to discipline ourselves to the purpose of godliness. And that's, that's an everyday thing, an every moment of the day thing for each one of us as we go through life. So I know all of you did do this. Uh, I know that you were faithfully reading through your Our Daily Bread devotional, and you probably took note on February 11th, there was one written by Leslie Kahn. I thought it was really good. She told the story about a group of workers that were uh, out on a frozen lake and they were cutting out um, blocks of ice to do for blocks of ice. And so they were cutting them out and loaded them up and they brought them back to the ice house where they were gonna be stored and they were unloading them inside the ice house. And when they were finished doing that, one of the workers realized, "Uh uh-oh, my watch fell off somewhere in here. They didn't know where, because they had done a whole lot of these and weren't sure where it happened at. And they started looking and looking and looking, but it was dark. There's no lights in there. There's nothing to help. And they finally just decided, let's just give up on it. So they left and they went outside and went back onto the lake to start chopping and cutting some more. And there was a young boy that was outside there and he heard them talking about it. And so when they started to walk away, he went inside the ice house. And it wasn't a real long time, probably just a matter of moments. He came out, went out onto the lake, and said, here's your watch. (laughs) They were amazed. How did you do that? And his answer was this. I just sat down, kept quiet, 
and soon I could hear it ticking. Isn't that so true? Sometimes God speaks to us in the whisper. As soon as I said that, I know your mind went instantly to 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 12, where God told Elijah that I want you to go on the mountainside and I'm going to speak to you. I'm going to reveal myself to you. You just stay there. And the first thing that happens is this horrendous amount of wind comes and there's a, it causes a, an avalanche of a sort, but God wasn't in wind. And then an earthquake comes and there's all kinds of rattling and, and violence of the earth, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And then there's fire and blazing and flaming, but God wasn't in that. And it turns out that God was in the whisper, which is so often what he does with us. While we're fussing and fighting and doing our thing, God is just quietly waiting, and then he decides to whisper to us. How many of you remember President Trump? Does anybody remember? Yeah, I think some of you do. Thank you. Oh, that's good. Well, then maybe, because uh, I know some of you are my age, so I know that could have been a tough question. And so maybe if you remember that, maybe you remember what it was like one year ago. One year ago, you and I were really, really busy. We were busy people, and life was very crowded and noisy. There was a lot of stuff coming on. And when it's busy like that, it's hard to always hear God. But then something changed. Everything changed. It was the invention of Zoom. Yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but I had never heard of Zoom before a year ago. I do wish I invested stock in them. But anyhow, um, I had never heard of them. The only thing I knew about Zoom was back in the 1970s, I worked at a place where I was able to get a, um, a kid's thing that was, um, it was a, a record of 45. For some of you, that's a, a piece of vinyl material that has ridges in it and, and you put it on a spinet. Anyhow, um, it was Zoom and it was a birthday thing for children. And the character sang, my name is Zoom and I live on the moon. And I came down to earth just to sing you this tune. Hey, Matilda, it's your birthday today. It's a great song. Um, see me later on it. It really is great. Everything changed a year ago. And so now all of a sudden, we're, I think in the last year, a lot of us learned a whole lot more about isolation and being quiet and in solitude. Some of that's been really hard, really, really hard. And for some people, it's all been hard, and, and I don't minimize that at all. For some, maybe at times for me, it was a little bit easy. Um, but it's important for us at times to experience silence and solitude. We have to take action and strategically disengage from this hectic pace of life that you and I keep living. We need to eliminate the noise and the clutter, at least from time to time we need to. And, and we have to, most importantly, we need to do all that so we can prepare our hearts for what we really need to do, what we really need to be a part of. Um, we don't always like that, do we? Quiet and solitude, silence, sometimes uh, when we experience that, it's a little bit disappointing when we look at ourselves. And, and then sometimes when we look at ourselves, it can be downright frightening. But it's an important exercise for us to be a part of and to do. So today we're going to do that, and we're going to go at a racing pace, which is the opposite of what I want you to do as a result of this. But we're going to take a look and and race through a bunch of scriptures. And good news for you, especially in the audience here, um, it's in your bulletin. I'm not gonna have you turning to all those, um, but they're all there so you can read them later on and hopefully you get a better understanding of what we're trying to say today. So here's what we wanna talk about first. What does Jesus say and experience about private prayer and private worship? Now, there's a lot more than what I'm giving you here today, but we'd be here all week if we did all of it. But in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, I have that reproduced as our verse of the week in your bulletin. 
and it's from the Sermon on the Mount, and he tells us that we are to pray privately. And basically, he's telling us in that passage that it's not about show. <laughs> Some people have done that. Probably, I don't think it's happened here, but I have seen it in other places where it can become a show. It's all an attention grabber for some of them, which is what it was like for the Pharisees in the day of Jesus. They went out on the corner, they, they said it out loud, they wanted people to watch and see what they were doing. So everybody would be like, oh wow, aren't they so impressive? Aren't they so important? Jesus said, don't do that. Don't do that. It's not for a show. It's not to get attention. In fact, what you really would do better is to go into your closet. And that's where you pray. Go somewhere private and where you can just be by yourself and pray to the Father who is unseen. And he's going to reward you. And I know in the scripture it doesn't say this, but I think it's implied in the Greek. He's going to reward you openly. He's going to bless you in your life as you privately meet with him. He wants to meet with you in the privacy of your heart. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, you have to realize Herod had just killed John the baptizer. And there was all this stuff going on, a lot of activity and, and a lot of tension. And Jesus withdraws to a private place. And ultimately, because the crowds are coming, uh, right at that time, he feeds the 5,000 men and all the women and the children that are there as well. And then he tells his disciples <clears throat> that we need to get alone on the mountainside. Uh, I like phrases that I've heard in the past where he would say, separate yourself, uh, come from among them, uh, let's get away. Jesus was suggesting basically, we need a retreat. We need to get away and, and be alone. In Mark chapter 6, verses 30 and 31, it's the same time frame. John the baptizer has been put to death, the feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus took his disciples to a quiet place. They need, and he says, we need to get some rest. Interesting. After the intense ministry that they've been through, now they need to recharge and rest and refresh themselves. In Luke chapter five, verses 15 and 16, Jesus had healed a leper, someone with a, a horrific disease, skin disease, and, and, um, and the news of that spread far and wide, and people were coming and coming, and they're coming in droves of people. And Jesus withdraws to a lonely place to pray. In fact, Luke says that Jesus often would withdraw to a lonely place to pray. That was his pattern. Jesus knew that he needed to get away and be with his father and, and spend time with him and pray because of the daily tasks that he was uh, facing. And it, it was stressful. It was huge what he was going through. And if Jesus needed that, Come on now, well, who do we think we are? <laughs> if he needed it, how much more do you and I need to get away to a lonely place to pray to our Lord? Well, in case you have trouble identifying with the sovereign God of the universe, how about the psalmist and some of the things that the psalmist expressed about private prayer? And trust me on this, there is just so much more on this in scripture than what we're going into today. Uh, we, again, are not being exhaustive. Psalm 40, verse one, uh, it's, it's a psalm about praise because of the past deliverance that God had brought. And, and the psalmist says, I waited patiently for you and you heard my cry. I get the impression that he had quieted himself before the Lord and, and just waited and wanted to hear from God. And he acknowledges that he did indeed hear from God. God answered. As you read through Psalm 40, you find that the psalmist there uh, offers himself in dedication to God because of all that God had done for him. How about Psalm 46? And, and that's just a phenomenal psalm. And I'm only going to touch on verse 10 because of what it says, but it also is a psalm of great trust and tremendous thanks to God. And in verse 10, he says, be still, 
be still. It literally means cease from your warlike activities. It's as if the more you work and, and struggle and strive to do even the good things, it's almost like you're resisting what God wants to do. Stop that. Cease that striving and wait on the Lord. That's what he wants us to do. There is value, great value, in being still before God. And he goes on to say, know that I am God. <laughs> we need to be still and acknowledge the supremacy of our God. He also has in there, do not fret, because I will be exalted. I'll be exalted above the nations. I'll be exalted across the earth. I think he's just telling us that our God can rescue us. He can work for our behalf. And then we have the passage that David just read for us in Psalm 37, and it is a great passage. Um, and he tells us in there a couple times, do not fret. That seems to be the theme that I'm seeing here a lot is the phrase of do not fret. And that's probably normal because I've heard, if you do the King James Version of where it says fear not, I've heard that there's 365 times in the Bible that it says fear not. And some brilliant scholar said that's one for every day. So if you need a new one every day, there it is. So do not fret, fear not. And in Psalm 37, because of the evil men. And it's interesting, when he says, uh, do not fret, it literally means, do not be incensed. Do not be angry. Do not be indignant because of all that evil that's going on around you. By the way, in the last year, not only have we seen a lot of isolation, but we have seen some of the darker, worst side of humanity in the last year. I'm sure it can get worse, but you wonder how. And, um, and it's been disappointing, it's been frustrating, it's made us all angry at times, and God would just say, do not fret, do not fear. Uh, even when we see the evil of men, when you get to verse three and verse four, um, it tells us that we don't need to fret because we can trust and do good and delight in the Lord. And it also adds in verse 4 that God will give us the desires of our heart. That's good because I've always wanted a classic 1957 Ford Thunderbird. Love that car. I'd love to have that. So all I got to do is just say, okay, God, I, I like you and I'm going to trust you. So give me that Ford T-Bird, right? I don't think so. I don't think that's what he's saying. He's going to give you the desires of your heart, but he's going to give to you desires in your heart as you trust him. Uh, in other words, his desires are going to be transferred into your heart the more you trust him. And then he's going to, yeah, then he'll do what you want because you're doing what he wants. And so, yeah, he will do that. But then in verse 7 it, there, it tells us, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their evil ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. You and I need to be reminded of that every once in a while, don't we? It's good to remind ourselves that uh, God is in control. He is sovereign. So here's another passage that I wanted to think about, and I am thinking about the do not fret and I am thinking about silence and solitude. And this is one of my, believe it or not, one of my favorite passages on this subject. So I hope, although I will inadequately express this and explain it, I hope that in your mind you can tie it all together really, really well. Um, I'm thinking about the tiny little book of Habakkuk. Now, again, you can look at this later, but you're going to find that Habakkuk is the pages that are still stuck together in your Bible. And uh, they come just be behind the prophet Nahum and just before Zephaniah. And again, they're pages that are probably stuck together still. Habakkuk, I call this Habakkuk on not-so-private prayer. I don't, I don't know that he, um, he prayed this out loud or, or who overheard his discussions with God, but you and I know about it, so it can't be that private. Just to give you a time frame, Habakkuk was a prophet in Israel, in Judah, and he was there just before Nebuchadnezzar came and, and wiped him out and took him into captivity. 
So literally, this is like a year before that happens. So the tensions are rising. And a part of it, and a big part of it is because the ruler who was over Judah at that time was Jehoiakim. And Jeremiah said about Jehoiakim that he was intent on dishonest gain and shedding of blood. He practiced oppression and extortion. Not the best testimony given for anybody else. He was, a, he was an evil person and, and he had evil schemes and idolatry went wild at this time, which is all the reasons why God sent them into captivity. So Habakkuk, seeing all this happening and knowing what's about to happen, asks two really big questions. And I think you, you ask those questions from time to time, haven't you? How long will you allow the wicked to prevail and the righteous to suffer? It's just not right what's going on. And God, you are God. Where are you? What are you doing? How long are you going to let this happen? This is evil that's coming at us. It's pretty tough questions. And, and so in the first couple of verses of Habakkuk, um, he asks those questions. And then God gives him an answer in verse 5. And the answer is simply this. Look around and watch what I'm doing. Look around and see what's happening. Be utterly amazed at what I'm about. You're not going to believe what I'm about to do. Okay, that's pretty cool. I I am amazed. Thank you, God, for doing this. What are you going to do? Verse 6, he says, I... This is great. This is amazing. I am raising up, you ready for this? Babylon. Babylon. I'm raising up Babylon. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. You're going to be amazed. Babylon. God even says that Babylon was ruthless and impetuous. And I I add the word barbaric because they were. They were very barbaric. Well, that caused... Habakkuk to ask another question. And his next question in chapter 1, verses 12 and 13 is, how can you use such wicked people? How can you do that? Them? Babylon? You're way too good for this, God. What in the world are you thinking? Why are you silent about this? What are you doing here? Well, he gives an answer. In verse chapter, uh, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, and his answer is, is, well, just watch and see. You wait a little bit and watch what I'm doing, and you'll see. You'll figure it out. By the way, isn't that what God tells us sometimes when we're going through some things that don't make sense to us? And God just says, wait a minute, wait, just wait, calm down, wait a little bit, watch and see. You'll be amazed. If you just watch for what I'm doing, you will figure this out. And so the rest of chapter 2 is a sad story about how bad things are in in Judah at that time. Idolatry especially. Just really, really bad stuff going on there. And he comes to the final statement where he says, God says, and the righteous will live by his faith. Well, that's a powerful phrase. If you don't believe that, Our world, almost 500 years ago, completely changed to the point that it affects you every minute of your life because one man was impacted by the phrase, the just shall live by faith. His name was Martin Luther, by the way. Um, That's the phrase that just kept coming back to him. It changed his life because prior to that, he did everything he could possibly do to try to impress God and earn his approval, uh, he abused himself wickedly to try to just show God how how sorry he was for his sins until he finally grasped that the just will live by faith. Very impacting on him. Well, here God's describing all of Judah's apostasy and their violence and the evil that's among them. And God reminds them that the just shall live by faith And here's the verse that really hits me, and I love this verse, where Habakkuk said, But the Lord 
is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Now, all of us who are disciples of Pastor Ken Ashman from the Worcester Grace Brethren Church know this verse inside. In fact, we could probably sing this, and I'll bet a lot of you be able to do it. We sang this verse as our call to worship every Sunday for the centuries that he was pastor at Worcester Grace. Um, and, and it really was impacting, at least it was to me. It's like, you know, we need to do that. Remember two weeks ago when I read those, some of those 70 questions that God asked Job? And then Job finally said, I'm undone. I have no answers. I cannot stand in your presence. I'm a, I'm a foolish man. That's what I think about when I come to this. It's like, man, how wicked is the world? But God is on his throne. He's there. He's in his temple. And what you and I really need to do is we need to just shut up and listen to him and adore him and worship him and bow down and fall down before him. That's really what we need to be doing. They deserved judgment. And it was right that God sent them into the captivity. Their idols that they were clinging to and calling on were useless, useless. They'd made no sense at all. And God said, I'm here on the throne and you need to bow down before me and you need to worship me and me alone. Here is saying all the earth should be silent and heaven, heaven goes between awesome silence before God and explosive praise before God. I, I'm convinced that's what it's like. My friend Habby, uh, that's Habakkuk. Uh, he and I are tight, so I call him Habby sometimes. Uh, everything God does is designed for us. That's what he wants us to know. And that we're to see God and see his glory. Sometimes we just have to stop everything and be silent before him. So in chapter 3, Habakkuk tells us about... Um, <clears throat> just the response, the all. It says he gave a prayer, and it says this, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in all of your deeds, O oh, Lord. Renew them in our day and in our time. Make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. I've heard. I stand in all. Please do it again. Please keep working in us and have mercy on us. I surrender. And when he did that, God came and blessed. It's such an interesting thing. Ultimately, in life, what is real, what really, really matters is you and God, you and Christ. And in the end, I think we're going to come to the same conclusion that King Solomon came to. Remember when he wrote his one book called Ecclesiastes, where all the way through, he took every situation in life, everything that anybody could enjoy or treasure in life, and his conclusion about it was, it's meaningless, it's me meaningless. Vanity, all is vanity, it's meaningless. And then at the very end of Ecclesiastes in chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, he says this, now all is heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. When I got to the end of life, this is all that really matters. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. What are you here for? You're here to fear, to know God, to fear him, to worship him, to serve him, and keep his commandments. For God will bring every deed into judgment. And that's true. That is absolutely true. Including everything, every hidden thing. You can't hide from God. Whether it's good or evil, it's all going to be brought out before God. So again, the main thing is the main thing. Fear God and keep his commands. So you and I need to be quiet in our hearts before him. And we need those times alone with Christ where he can speak to us. Not just us telling him what we think and what's important, but we need to be quiet before him. We need to have reading scripture times, letting the word of God speak to us. We need to have praying times where we're thinking and praying 
Uh, some would call that meditating, but I don't want you to get the wrong idea there. But we're waiting on God. We need to prepare our hearts for that, which may mean you have to unplug. <laughs> no TV, no music, no computer, no phone, no other people, no to-do list. And that's challenging, but we need a place to go. You need to have a closet. It doesn't have to be a closet, but your closet place. We need a time where there's no distractions. And if this is unusual, don't do what Martin Luther did. He prayed three to four hours every day, and then on busy days, he prayed longer. But um, you and I probably can't do that. But if it's new to you, start small. Start for minutes um, doing it. And we need to ask, as we prepare our hearts, what do I need? What do I need? What areas of my life need to change? Or what areas of my life do I need to emphasize? Maybe there's something good that is a part of your being and you need to do that more often. What are those things? The second question is what's in my way? What hinders me from doing those things I need to do to grow? What prevents my growing? And then what needs to go? What do I need to get rid of? And it could be the TV, music, computer, phone, all that list. It could be that kind of stuff. But it could be other things like guilt and regrets and failures from past mistakes. And maybe we need to come to God and seek forgiveness. And once God forgives, then comes the hard part. You have to forgive yourself too. He does. You, you're not greater than him. You need to forgive yourself as well and set that aside. All of that can help us understand where we are now and why we want to make the changes and improvements that we have to make so that we can please and honor Christ. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, indeed, we do want to just quiet our hearts as much as we can possibly do so in a moment of uh, introspection a moment when we can think about what in my life needs to change, either for um, bad things to get rid of, good things to emphasize and do more. Um, what prevents that? Lord, uh, we just want to open our hearts before you even now and allow you to search us and make known to us. May your Holy Spirit have freedom to just uh, address in our privacy of our own hearts and minds to tell us uh, what types of needs we may have to deal with today. Lord, we, um, we do that primarily because we understand what Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes. We need to know you and, and obey your commandments, and we want to do that. So we give you welcome now to search us and to uh, do your work in our hearts to bring glory to you. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Ritman Grace Podcast. If you have questions or would like to know more about our church, please visit www.ritmangrace.org or email us at ritmangbc at aol.com.